नंदन कथा बाय इंद्रा पात्सारती In this video B the students of Itraj College would like to present to you on the following topics Introduction to Indian literature Indian literature in translation Introduction to Dalit literature Introduction to Indra Patasarthi Background to Nandan Nandan Katha by Parthasarthi Themes from Nandan Katha Parayar in Dalit community Dalit struggle and a legend Common man to an uncommon Introduction to Indian literature Indian literature refers to the literature produced on the Indian subcontinent until 1947 and in the Republic of India thereafter the Republic of India has 22 official languages India a land of many states religions culture is also a land of many writers writing in many languages regional as well as english the diversity in dress tradition family life and settings provide rich fodder to the writers english as a language was introduced in india during british rule having learned a colonial language there were few indian writers who started writing in english the advent of indian literature in english can be traced to late 1800s and early 1900s when english education was established in the cities of madras bombay and calcutta the first book written by an indian in english was by said din mohammed titled travels of din mohammed mohammed's travel narrative was published in 1794 the first play in english krishnan mohan banerjee's the persecuted was published in 1831 the indian novel in english bankim chandra chatterjee's raj mohan's wife appeared in 1864 Roy wrote several pamphlets in English espousing the nationalist cause of Indian independence. He also published Brahminical magazine in English in 1821. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee's his work Bengali were also translated into English. After these two writers, the Indian literary scene was dominated by the trio of Raja Rao, Malkraj Anand and R K Narayan. Anita Desai novels are Cry the Peacock Fire on the Mountain and Clear Light of the Day Kushwan Singh's Train to Pakistan and Arun Joshi's The Apprentice were other popular book of period in 1980s with the publication of Salman Rushdie's Midnight Children Rushdie's novel traced the history of protagonist of Indian independence in 1960s and 2000s has witnessed the rise of many important Indian writers who have taken Indian literature to new heights these writers include Amitav Ghosh Vikram and Arundhati Roy Dan Gopal Mukherjee was the first Indian author to win a literary award in the United States. P. Lal, a poet, a translator, publisher, and essayist, founded a press in 1950s for Indian English writing and writers workshop. Indian translation. India has five language families, 14 major writing systems, 400 spoken languages and thousands of dialects we live in a world of continuous communication in different languages it crosses three bridges personal linguistic and cultural all intellectual transfers from the ancient to the present time depend on people who can move words sentences images and themes importance of translation in a multilingual society like india translation is important through literatures and translation the development of certain shared social vision is possible translation is necessary for emotional unshackling oral translation ancient india has a strong and vibrant oral culture music and literature were in the form of songs and poems 
So many versions of Bhagavad Gita stories and retelling of Ramayana and the Mahabharata. The Katha Sarit Sagara, the Jataka, the Hitopadesa are also narratives that inspired the spread of hybrid stories. This process of oral translation and transmission has always been our tradition. Indian translators and their works. In India, translation studies are concerned with quest for identity and quest for India. Ramadrana Tagore, A.K. Ramanujam, Purushottam Lal, Ganesh and Devi are some of the notable figures in the field of translation in India. Ramindranath Tagore, the famous Bengali poet and translator, won the Nobel Prize for his Geetanjali. He wrote poems, plays, novels, short stories, essays, satirical pieces and textbooks for children. While translating Geetanjali from Bengali into English, he refashioned the Bengali songs to suit their English sensibility. When he translated, he changed, omitted and he rewrote his poems in order to, in order to cater to the Western audience. He wrote in a rhythmically free biblical style of prose poetry which was familiar to the English. Critics do not see Tagore's translation as translation at all, but they look upon him as a bilingual writer. A.K. Ramanujam is a scholar, philologist, folklorist, poet, playwright and a translator. He became famous as a translator by his books The Interior Landscape. It is all about classical Tamil love poetry and poems of love and war. These books contained selection of his English version of classical Tamil love poetry. Ramanujam distinguishes between context-sensitive and context-free modes of thinking. According to him, the Euro-American culture is context-free while the Indian way of thinking is context-sensitive. He prefers a translation that revitalizes the context of the composition. Ramanujan's view is that the translation must not only represent but also it should uh, also represent the original. To him, a translator is one who walks a tightrope between the two languages and the form language is a double loyalty. P. Lal, the founder editor of Writers Workshop Publications in Kolkata. He is a teacher of English literature and a scholar of Sanskrit and Bangla. He has transcribed the whole of Mahabharata into English and also published a condensed version of the Mahabharata in 1979. His theory is a translator speaks only to his age while the original writer of the text may speak to the following generations. Dramatic elements of a text in Indian literature, translation given importance. He has treated myths and epics as oral culture experiences. Ganesh N. Devi He is a literary critic and an activist. He has to try to preserve oral tribal culture and stories in the written form. He is interested in the historical context of translation activity in India. He says that every major civilization in the world has its own view about translation. The civilization which have the Judaic and Christian view of life consider translation as the second version of the original text. But the civilization that believe in the rebirth, translation is treated as an other original. So, in India, every new version of the Ramayana and Mahabharata is considered to be sacred. Dalit Literature Dalit literature is a body of text produced by writers whose caste background used to be referred to as untouchables or scheduled caste. The term Dalit means crushed or ground down in Marathi and constitutes the nomenclature that Dalit writers have adopted for themselves. The history and roots of Dalit literature is still in the process of being written and negotiated. 
One of the first Dalit writers was Madara Chanaya at 11th century. Kobla said who lived during the reign of the Western Chalukyas and was also regarded by some scholars as the father of Vachana poetry. The origin of Dalit writing can also be traced back to Buddhist literature or to mainly Marathi Dalit Bhakti poets like Gora, Chukkamela, Karma, Karma Mela, and to the Tamil Sittas or Chittas, many of the, whose hagiographics is accounts such as 12th century Periya Puranam suggest that they may have been Dalits. Modern Dalit writing only emerged as a distinct genre after the democratic and egalitarian and egalitarian thinkers such as the Sri Narayana Guru, Jyotipa Bhul, P. R. Ambedkar, etc. Dalit Literature in South India Indian writing in English has always had Dalit narratives, but majority of Dalit literature have been narratives from Brahmin or Savarvana writers with savior complex. The first person narrative of a Dalit man written by a Brahmin or Savarvana scholar elaborated as a helpless person busy lauding and victimizing himself while waiting for a savar savarna savior or dying miserably is quite a common scene. It limits the dimension of a caste narrative in early Indian writing in English. Indian writing is often an exploration of picturesque rural India, rural and urban families, glamorous coming of industrialization, urbanization and globalization. These narratives never addressed caste beyond a reference to helping sympathizing or saving the untouchables or origin. One thing should be abundantly clear, there really is such a thing as Dalit writing in Tamil. This did not used to be true until the past 20 or 30 years. Dalit people did not have much a literary voice. Now, though they have voices representing millions of Dalit, people who certainly do speak for themselves, but many of whom cannot write for themselves and would not be published if they did. Some of these voices translated into English are contained in, in these kinds of books. Introduction to Indra Parthasarathi Ranganathan Parthasarathi, whose pen name is Indra Parthasarathi, is a Tamil author born in Kumbakonam, Tanjavur district in 1930. With a master's degree in Tamil from Annamalai University, he secured a teaching job in a Delhi school and settled there, going on to become a university professor. In the 1980s, he taught at the University of Warsaw, Poland. His literary over that includes novels, short stories and plays generally revolves around life in Delhi, examining the modes and values of its Tamil middle class people. He obliged the Dakshin Bharat Nataka Sabha, Delhi, by writing his first play, Murray, in 1972. This was the first modern Tamil play staged by a Delhi group. He followed it up with Aurangzeb in 1973, which characterized the Mughal emperor differently from history textbooks and Nandan Kade in 1978, reinterpreting the story of an untouchable farmhand thirsting for the darshan of Shiva in a temple forbidden to him. This was an eternal favorite of poets and dramatists since the 8th century with several stage and screen incarnations in Parthasarathi's own lifetime. His version is significant in the contemporary political context of Dalit resurgence. Parthasarathi also wrote Kala Iyandarangal in 1977 and Porvai Purthi Udalgal in 1978. He founded the Sankara Das Vamigal School of Performing Arts at Pondicherry University and became its director, resuscitating a moribund Tamil theatre with adaptations of Silapadikaram and Shakespeare's King Lear. He then composed the highly acclaimed play Ramanujar in 1996 on the 11th century reformer, philosopher, and founder of the Vaishnava school of Vishta Darivitam. Nandan Kadai, directed by R. Raju in 1997, was perhaps the best production any of his plays. Some of his works have been staged in Hindi by troops in Delhi and Lucknow as well, often before they were performed in Tamil.
பேக்ரவுண்ட் நந்தன் தமிழ் பெரிய புராணம் த கிரேட் எபிக் இஸ் அ தமிழ் பொயட்டிக் அக்கவுண்ட் டெபிக்டிங் லெஜண்டரி லைஃப் ஆஃப் தி சிக்ஸ்டி த்ரீ நாயனர்ஸ் த கெனானிக்கல் தமிழ் பொயட்ஸ் கம்பைல்ட் ஜூரிங் த டுவெல்த் சென்ச்சுரி ஒன் புவம் ரெஃபர்ஸ் டு தி ஸ்டோரி ஆஃப் நந்தனார் அ புலையர் அண்ட் அன்டச்சபிள் இட் இஸ் செட் தட் ஹி யூஸ் டு சப்ளை லெதர் ஃபார் ட்ரம் அண்ட் ஸ்ட்ராப்ஸ் strings for lutes and various instruments for the worship of god he was known for his deep devotion to shiva and was longing to visit the nataraja temple of chidambaram but feared that his low birth would serve a hindrance to his temple entry he postponed his visit daily and for this reason he is also known as tirunale povar he who will go tomorrow One day he gathered enough courage and started off for Chidambaram and on reaching was overwhelmed by both happiness and despair outside the high wall of the temple he wasn't allowed in because of his caste on hearing his wails it is written that god himself appeared before the priests and commanded them to light a fire and lead nandana into the inner sanctum of the temple Many Dalits have criticized Nandana because spiritually he never dared to go beyond the worship of stone idols and for his what is seen as meat begging before Brahmins. However, some see this as an act of courage since for most Dalits of that time entering a temple could mean instant murder by the upper castes. He also won for his people the freedom to sing. Even if he only sang of his pain as a Dalit and his longing for god still for the first time a dalit voice was heard of popularly nandanar by the sublime sweetness of his tamil compelled indian society and indian literature to accept the entrance of a great singer nandanar was born in the dalit slum village of adanur of tamil nadu he is known as the first hero in the dalit resistance struggle nandanar lived in a time when dalit voices were never heard in social life it was an era in which dalits gained only partial freedom by converting to buddhism or jainism however for dalits trapped in the grip of the puranic hindu religion not only were they never to be heard they were considered too wild to ever be seen by the rest of the society many dalits have criticized nandana because spiritually he never attained realization to go beyond the worship of stone idols socially also he is criticized for his meek begging from arrogant brahmins to be allowed to worship the idol of shiva in the temple city of chidambaram such critics fail to realize that for the first time in history a dalit tried to enter a brahmin temple for a dalit it was a crime to even step foot in the urban complex of chidambaram This was an act of unbounded courage since for most Dalits it meant instant murder by the upper castes. Second, all Dalits are forever indebted to Nandana because he won for them their very first freedom, the freedom to sing. Even if he only sang of his pain as a Dalit and his longing for Shiva, still for the first time a Dalit voice was heard in India. Before Nandana Dalit voices were completely silenced in social and cultural life. Nandana by the overwhelming power of his devotion by the sublime sweetness of Tamil compelled Indian society and literature to accept the entrance of great Dalit devotee. It was a historic first for Dalits. While it is true that Nandana did not transcend the superstitious stone idol worship of his times his bhakti transcends the bhakti of any dalit of the 20th century moreover nandana was the first dalit martyr the brahmins of chidambaram afraid of the power of his devotional songs in the society set him on fire and burned him to death yet even in death nandana was victorious the people of tamil nadu never forget the devotional sublimity of his songs even brahmin writers were forced to acknowledge the devotional greatness and sanctity of nandana this in itself was a revolution in the dark age of the puranic rajayan
नंदन कथा बाई पार्थ सारथी The entire story revolves around the main character called Nandan. Nandan though a Dalit by birth wants to live a life like a Brahmin. To him, Brahmanism is the only way to attain God. As a Paryan, he is forbidden to enter into the temple. A Dasi girl Abhirami helps him to have his darshan and later becomes his beloved. Nandan argues with his people to change his apartment so that they can enter into the temple. The upper caste people rise against Nandan and his doings. In order to stop his sudden growth, they start exploiting Nandan as a saint. They trap him, saying that God appeared in their dream and command them to accept Nandan as his devotee. In the end, with the help of Vedic Brahmin, they convince Nandan to march into the fire to merge with God. They ask him to pray for whole night so that the fields will be harvested by God's grace. Cunningly, all turn against Nandan. Even his fellow men dislike him, turning as a spiritual man. The upper caste people inform him that God has given a command to dip into fire so that he will be get purified. Believing them, Nandan accepts their words and prepares himself to dip in fire. This shows a peak of casteism and how one can go to whatever extent to suppress the Dalits when they try to come out of their suppressed state. He includes Abhirami with him to get purified and at the end, Nandan enters into the fire with Abhirami. The trap of the upper caste people becomes successful. Nandan, who believes them, surrender his life into fire. His ignorance makes his dedication as a genuine cause but the social practice of suppressing dalit people is represented by nandan because he didn't fight for the upliftment of dalit instead he tried to change them into parliament to lose their own identity as a dalit nandan is exploited in the name of god the omnipotent who is believed to protect people remains a subject to question Human beings believe that God created man, but the bitter truth is that man created God according to his desire. In the name of God, man gave Varna, which divided man into various stages. Even today, variations are found at every level of society. Centuries have passed, but discrimination exists, leaving suppression in the hands of oppression. In contemporary literary studies, a theme is a central topic, subject, or a message within a narrative. A theme may be exemplified by the actions, utterances, or thoughts of a character in a novel. A story may have several themes. Themes often explore historically common or cross-culturally recognizable ideas such as ethical questions and are usually implied rather than stated explicitly. In Nantan Katha by Indira Patasarathi, the following themes like religious worship or devotion, caste, dance, Dalit struggles, love, social discrimination, and betrayal have been explored. The very first theme here is religious worship or devotion. As we all know, this play revolves around spirituality because Dalits work as temple servants. The setting is also in and around the temple. Nandan from Dalit community has a staunch devotion on Lord Nadraja. Even his ambition is to enter the Shiva temple at Chidambaram to enjoy the beauty of Nadraja closely. At the end of the play, Nandan falls into fire in order to reach God. Nandan's spirituality is highlighted more than anything. This reveals us his true devotion towards God. The next theme here is the caste. It is a class structure that is determined by birth. Pulayars, Pallars, Pariyars are some of the large Dalit communities. So, in society, the Dalit communities were looked down upon by the upper caste. Due to this, the Dalits were alienated and they were treated only as slaves. In this play, clashes were present between the castes like Brahmin, who in society considered as the upper caste, and Dalits as a lower caste. Here, in this play, the Vedias dominated Dalits and did not allow them to enter into the temple. So, therefore, the term inequality is evident in this play. The next theme I have mentioned here is dance. Nataraja is a Hindu god. It is Lord Shiva in his form as a cosmic dancer. As we all know, Nataraja represents as Lord of Dance. Nandan's partner Abhirami is also a dancer. As Abhirami in this play is portrayed as Devadasi, usually Devadasis are female artists who learns Indian artistic traditions such as Bharatanatyam, 
Kuchipudi, Mohiniyattam, etc. So they are closely connected to the traditions of India. Nandan adores the beauty of Abhirami's dance and in the middle, he even asserts that he saw Nadraja himself through her dance. Moving on to the next theme, Dalit struggles. Because of their caste, they were terribly oppressed by the upper caste. They were treated as untouchables and outcasts. They were kept at the very bottom of the social ladder for generations by the upper caste people. They suffered a lot under the domination and Nandan, though a Dalit by birth, he wanted to live a life of a Brahmin because he feels that it is the only way to attain God. Love is the next theme. Nandan loved Abhirami after seeing her beautiful dance. Abhirami helped Nandan to have his darshan inside the temple out of affection. Love between them was an abundance that they even died together. Theme love here is significant as their love did not have any complication in the name of caste. Social discrimination is one of the significant theme in this play. This social discrimination is the social practice of suppressing Dalits. It is represented by Nandan in this play. There is this inequality between Vedias who are Brahmin, landlords and Nandan a bonded labor of Vedias. At one point of time, he himself blames for his low birth. Dalits have been victims of class-related economic exploitation by the upper caste landlords. Even bullocks were allowed inside the temples, whereas the Dalits weren't. They tell Nandan to worship the folk deities of the Paraya instead of Shiva, the god of Brahmanical Hinduism. The suppression of Dalit people continued. Nandan understands the discrimination and filthy law made by the rich, and he teaches his fellow players who had lack of understanding and awareness of what is actually happening around them. Betrayal, the last theme of this play. In the climax scene of the play, the test by fire by the Vedia priest, the Vedia landholder, and two non brahmin upper caste are collaborators conspire to do away with Nandan, exploiting his piety, spirituality, which they see as threats to their existence. They dislike Nandan's growth. To stop that, they trap him saying that God appeared in their dream and commanded them to accept Nandan as his devotee. They betrayed Nandan and convinced him to march into the fire to reach God and to be purified. Nandan takes Abhirami too to get purified and they both die in a place. The upper caste ruthlessly killed by betraying both of them. So, there ends the story. They were exploited in the name of God. No matter how many centuries have passed, but discrimination exists leaving suppression in the hands of the oppression. Parayar in Dalit community Parayars are a Dalit community with a significant presence in South India. They are predominantly agricultural laborers living in the rural parts of the country. However, according to the Hindu social order, they occupy a low status due to their traditional occupation of dealing with dead animals, which in turn makes them ritually impure and socially polluting. This resulted in their untouchable status. Thus, the parayar outcast status operates at both religious and social stratums. Unlike other theories regarding the origin of the caste system in India, parayars have their own myths of origin. The common understanding is that parayars descended from a relatively equal position or even superior status to Brahmin. Some of the myths suggest that actually the Parayar is the elder brother and the Brahmin is the younger brother. Through such interpretation, Parayars claim precedence over Brahmins. Robert Dillage suggests that if the Parayars are poor, suffering and hardworking, it is not because of their deeds in a previous life or because of some congenital defect but because of a misunderstanding about their mythical ancestor. Consequently, the low status of the Parayas as a whole is largely underserved. The important observation is that Parayas were once in an equal social status and succumbed to lower caste. Satyanathan Clock provides another theoretical viewpoint that the Parayas are not 
Dalits because of their low and many occupations. Rather, they are condemned to these occupations as a punishment for breaching caste laws established and enforced by the caste communities. He also accounts for Paria's association with the Parai drum, which provides them with their vocation and identity. However, not all Parias engage in the drum beating profession. Michael Baganta traces a more recent 19th century understanding of Paria's origin through the work of Ayoti Thasa, who claims them to be the disinherited children of the soil. These differing preceding observations capture the difficulty of defining and pinpointing the origin of Paris, whether Christian or Hindu. Various researchers conducted among Paris conclude that in spite of the historical substantiation, they hold a culturally unique place in South Indian society. Moreover, with a significant population, they have come to represent other outcast communities in contemporary Tamil Nadu. In Indra Parthasarthi's drama, Nandan Katha, he brings out the condition of abject poverty, unhealthy and insanitary conditions in which the Dalit people have been sheltered, but they held a belief that they are accursed to live such lives. Nandan has been the symbol of Dalit aspiration for liberation. This protest against injustice sought to find a voice for oppression and indoctrination could have hardened their frustration and made them believe that they are destined to suffer as slaves and there is no escape other than the religious route. Nandan feels ashamed by looking at the ways of his people's living. The people of Parir community are living a barbarous life and they pour toddy even to the God and worship him. Nandan wants to transform his people's mind by making them realize that they are not meant only to grow their belly and the purpose of their birth is not that. The lower caste people like the Parian community are treated lower than animals. For the upper caste people who allow the bullock to go into the temple but do not permit the Parian. Even though the Parian are the ones who were used to supply flowers and musical instruments made of leather to temples and who were used for constructing temple ponds, they are treated inferior by the upper caste people. Through Nandan, Indra Parthasarathi raises his voice for the whole Parian community and also expects all the Parian people should think that they are not slaves to the landlords. He says that all living creatures in earth are equal before God. <laughs> Dalit struggle and a legend. Dalits, who constitute a little over one sixth of India's one billion people, have for generations been at the very bottom of the social ladder. They are kept outside and subsequent to the four tier hierarchical caste structure sanctified by Varnashrama Dharma. Dalits have been victims of class related economic exploitation by upper caste landholders. The Pulayas, the Parayas and the Pallas are some of the large Dalit communities. Nandan, in a way, has been the symbol of Dalit aspiration for liberation since the 8th century. The evolution of the story of Nandan from a brief reference to his inner pity by the Tamil Saivati Sri and poet Sundararar, one of the 63 Nyamas of the Saivati order. To Indra Pathasadi's Nandan Kadai, through several reinterpretations is interesting. One stanza in the collection of poems on the lives of Nayamar says that Tirunale Poor belonged to Adanur and was birthed a Pulaya. The poem also says that he visited Chidambaram temple by God's grace and 3000 Brahmins of Chidambaram saluted him. 
a more elaborated narration of the story of Nandan was provided by the 12th century Tamil poet Sekirar in his Thirutondor Puranam. Unlike in some later versions, Sekira's account of Nandan's life does not mention any conflict between Nandan and others. From the early versions of the story of Nandan, one can infer that any aspiration for liberation on the part of Dalits could have been only at the individual level. Religious discourse to which they could have been access might have convinced them that the salvation lay in attaining mukti through bhakti, and this would liberate them from the low birth which Nandan holds responsible for all their ills. The temples constructed during the Pallava and Chola period with all their architectural grandeur and splendor besides the music and dance associated with them could have stimulated individuals aspiration in this direction. Seven centuries later came the fourth version of the legend Gopala Krishna Bharati's musical opera Nandanar Charitra Kirtanai. It came in print in 1861. The opera took a totally different view of the story. He introduced a new character, Vedyar, a Brahmin landlord. In the opera, Nandan was shown as a bonded laborer of Vedyar attached to the land. The conflict between Nandan and his master gets reflected in their dialogue. Nandan was asked to do the impossible work all night to finish farm operation by dawn if he was to go to the temple the next morning. A hundred years after Gopala Krishna Bharati's opera came Indra Parthasadi's Nandan Kadai in Tamil. This period from 1861 to 1978 was very crucial in Indian history. All these movements were instrumental in taking the Dalit quest for liberation to a higher plane, highlighting its social, political and economic dimensions. Dalits of Tanjavur made in their struggle against upper caste landholders. The period saw the end of numerous atrocities against farm workers, the majority of whom were Dalits. It was in this background of Indra Parthasarthi's wrote his Nandan Kadai. He reconstructs the story with some significant changes. First and foremost, he shifts the story from the realm of religion to that of culture. A short story by Pudme Pitten, Pudhiya Nandan, is an adaptation of the Nandan story with characters from contemporary life finding themselves in situations similar to Nandan's. In a significant observation, she says, in the essentialist way, Nandan's devotion was cited down the ages to play down the social inequities and play up his spiritual qualifications. an uncommon. The play, The Legend of Nandan, Nandan Kadai, written by Indra Parthasarathy, is based on a story that's been in circulation among the Tamil-speaking people for over a thousand years. It's about Nandan, a 8th century Dalit farm worker and a temple servant whose only aim was to enter the Shiva temple at Chidambaram to enjoy the beauty of Nadraja's cosmic dance. Unfortunately, the people of upper caste play tricks on him and use his innocence to destroy him. Through this play, the author not only brings the ordeal of Nandan, but also projects the kind of life that his people lead in the unhealthy and unsanitary conditions. Indra Parthasarathy, being a non-Dalit writer, gains significance for portraying the harsh lives of the Dalit people. Nandan, over the course of time, transforms from a common man to an uncommon man by proving his devotion to God by marching into the fire at the end deliberately in order to restore faith among his people. He believed that his salvation lay in attaining mukti, that is the faith of God, through bhakti. And this way, he has become a symbol of Dalit aspiration for liberation. The act of Nandan depicts the fight that he is putting in order to free him and his people from centuries of oppression. And the centuries of oppression and indoctrination have made the people of his community believe that they are destined to lead their lives this way. He wanted to change this. He wanted to change their mindsets. He wanted to change their Parayan way of living. He is not ashamed of his birth as a Parayan just because people consider them as lowborn. But he is ashamed of the life that his people are living because they are barbarous and live in poor sanitary conditions. They seem to have accepted this form of living and 
they have somehow believed that they are accustomed to this way of living. And these people were ill-treated, they were treated lower than the animals, they were exploited, they were denied entry into the temples, even though they were the ones who gave flowers and musical instruments made of leather and even built ponds for the temples. The upper caste people considered the Dalits as lower caste, which he thought needed to change by making his people enter into the Parpara temple. He thinks that the inner beauty of the Almighty will transform a man into a complete person. He wanted his people to think that they are not the slaves to anyone. He believes that the inner beauty will pave the way for intellectual thoughts and soon the people will start realizing their identity. Though there were initial oppositions among his people itself, they began to understand Nandan and began to support his cause. Nandan's thought of reforming the minds of his people soon reached the people of the upper caste and they could not tolerate the activities of Nandan. They feared that their supremacy would be gone and they wanted him gone for good. So a Mudalayar, a Veliyar and a Udayar devised a plan to vanquish Nandan. Though Mudalayar and Udayar suggest physical torture to Nandan, Vediyar intrudes and says that a Vediyar can win anyone with his tandram and mandram. One can really witness how cruel these people were and how their supremacy is a threat to one's life. As said earlier, these people use Nandan's innocence to exploit him and they use his devotion to God as a bait and lure him into their trap. They trap him by saying that God appeared in their dream and commanded them to accept Nandan as his devotee. In the end, they convince Nandan to march into the fire by saying that it's a command from God to get purified so that he can merge with God. So Nandan, along with his beloved Abhirami, marched into the fire knowing that it would take their life away. He did this because if he steps back, he knows that all his hard work of trying to change people's destiny will go in vain and they had succumbed to their old ways of barbarous living. And here, Nandan was just a common man until he wanted to change his and his people's oppressed way of living and their destiny. And that is how Nandan transformed from a common man to an uncommon man.